Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mohamed Ogendi. I'm the host of this panel. And the topic today is how do I communicate my academic story? So we are joined here by three panelists, Dr. Prachi, Dr. Yolanda, Dr. Jennifer. So can you please just introduce yourselves real quick? Do you care the order? Let's start with Dr. Prachi. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Prachi Abbasi, Associate Professor of Biochemistry and Cell Biology at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. And I'm also the president of the Publishing Transparency and Innovation nonprofit ASAP Bio. And I sit on advisory boards of several organizations concerned with scholarly publishing and the future of the scientific research enterprise. All right. And Dr. Yolanda? Good morning. First and foremost, I apologize that my camera is not seeming to agree with me this morning. I am here. It says it's on, but it doesn't seem like I am viewable. I'm an associate professor here at the School of Education at Johns Hopkins. I am also department chair of advanced studies in education, which is our doctoral programs and our MEHP, Masters of Education in the Health Professions. I am also chair of my family school community partnerships, SIG, and ARA, and do a host of other things, which we'll talk about today. Thank you. Okay, and finally, Dr. Watson. Hi, I'm uh, Jennifer. Actually, my name is Jennifer Watson Wester. I think I got cut off. Um, so either way, Dr. Wester. Um, I am the assistant professor of art history at Notre Dame of Maryland University in Baltimore. And I'm also the gallery director. So I run two galleries there in addition to a whole host of administrative duties that come with working at a small college. Um, so you'll hear more about that too. Great. So for our audience, please note that this session is being recorded and that you can insert any questions into the chat. We will address the questions at the end of the segment. We have five segments today, and I'll let you know once each segment ends. All right. So now let's get to background and introduction. So this is a panel about how do I communicate my academic story? So how about you start us off by communicating your academic story to us? And this time, let's start with Dr. Jennifer. Oh, gosh, don't make me go first. <laughs> so this is such a <laughs> challenging question um, because it really the way I communicate my story really depends on who my audience is and you know what is the purpose of that communication. Am I applying for a job in a particular field or am I networking? Um, but I can give you a sort of general um, introduction to my academic story and then we can talk about different ways of um, translating that. So my academic story really begins as an undergraduate. I was an art history major at Middlebury College and a French major. And um, my interest in academia really began when I spent a year abroad in uh, Europe. I did Italy and France. And in my semester in France, um, took a course on this group of artists called the Nouveau Realiste that I had never heard of in my American university studies um, and just became really fascinated by them and fascinated by the experience of studying something that I could see in person, you know, living in Paris and seeing the work there. Um, and so when I came back, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on that group um, and that experience of writing a thesis, you know, doing the independent research, working on this extended project for an entire year. Um, I really loved it. And it was not something, you know, I was not somebody who was aware of graduate school or PhDs prior to that. And it really um, sparked something in me that this is something I want to continue to do. There are questions I still want to answer. Um, and so when I found my way to graduate school, um, I came to Johns Hopkins for my PhD. I intended to continue studying that same group of artists. Um, but what happened is in the years between when I wrote my undergraduate thesis and my started writing my dissertation is there was a huge shift in the scholarship on that field. Um, a, a new generation of scholars was really starting to question everything we had thought we had known about this group of artists and what they were trying to do. And there was this huge push toward revisionism. And so I kind of caught that wave and had to kind of reframe everything, every way that I had thought about the questions I had been asking as an undergraduate. And so it was a really formative experience for me as a scholar to um, let go of the things I thought I was going to argue and um, adjust my thinking. And this meant doing a lot more contextual work, really studying the literature and the art and the film and the literary theory all together and become more of an inter interdisciplinary scholar. So I had this kind of transformation in graduate school and that interdisciplinary approach that I picked up as I'm trying to you know, make my way in this field that is shifting, um, that really allowed me to think about myself as a scholar in a different way. And when I graduated, you know, I was able to um, approach different 
options for careers um, because I'd had this experience, this deep research experience and coursework experience outside of my little narrow bubble of this one little movement of post-war French art. Um, and that led me to take all kinds of jobs that I never would have envisioned for myself, um, working for a nonprofit, uh, teaching courses way outside my specialty um, in film studies and illustration. Um, and all of that really fed into where I ended up in my career, which is um, as an assistant professor and gallery director at a school that is very small. So I'm the only art historian and I have to teach as a generalist. So I teach everything from prehistory to the present. Um, I run these galleries, which is not something I had any experience in, but because I had sort of um, dipped my toes in a lot of different areas throughout my graduate career and immediately after, um, I've been able to just kind of say yes and adapt and grow in that way. Um, and so my, my academic life has um, really shifted very far from where I thought it would be with that narrow focus on this, there's this this subject that I'm very interested in and I just want to dive into these books and read them and write about it. And now it's really opened up and broadened. And my experience at Notre Dame, um, which is a women's college uh, with a very strong mission of, of social justice, has really also affected the way I approach my scholarship, my teaching and my gallery directing and really focusing, you know, shifting my attention away from some of the questions and stories that I had been studying all through graduate school and really thinking about whose stories aren't being told um, and especially as relates to like race and gender. So my scholarship and everything and teaching have really shifted as well in response to my new environment. That's my job. Wow. No. <laughs> that was an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for that. No, no, no. That was really good. No, no, no. Thank you so much. Um, so Dr. Yolanda, how do you communicate your academic story? So my academic story actually started, I would say, in elementary school, in so much that I love school. In 12 years, I missed a day and a half, and they were both in senior year, and they were for personal reasons. So when I was 15, I actually made the decision that I wanted to earn a doctorate. It was not, however, in education. I thought I was going to earn a doctorate in counseling. And when I went to undergrad, I was a psych major. And as I was approaching graduation, I could not decide what I wanted to specialize in in terms of psychology. I just knew I did not want to do um, clinical psychology. I didn't want to mess with the medicine. That's not what my interest was. And my focus also was on children. I do identify as a black woman. So working with black and brown children in particular was of importance to me at that point in time. I'd done some tutoring and some other types of things while I was in undergrad. And so I was in the career services office um, trying to figure out what to do to kind of narrow my choices as graduation was approaching. And I came across this ad for a program called Teach for America. Long story short, I applied and was accepted. And that's what brought me to Baltimore in 1992, many, many, many years ago. And that's what switched my trajectory to education. I did not make the immediate leap from being a classroom teacher to being a university professor. I did a variety of things in between. Most notably, I went to work with teen moms because I thought if we really wanted to help children, we needed to help their parents. And I picked teen parents because they have that unique position of still being children themselves, not that they think of themselves that way, yet being someone's parent and responsible for nurturing you know, that next generation instead of people. And that led me into doing work specifically with fathers. And you'll notice I'm not saying teen fathers because at that point in the mid nineties, the fathers of African-American teen moms were not necessarily teenagers themselves. But long story short, I got very engaged in father involvement work in a variety of ways, so much so that that's what my dissertation actually was on, African-American father engagement. So within that context, I made that transition to finally start my doctoral studies, and I focused on father engagement, African-American father engagement. I also made that choice to do that here at Hopkins at what was then Spisby and is now the School of Ed so that I was working as an instructor initially. So I think on some levels, my entry into the academy has been different than the traditional earn your doctorate and you know get your tenure track line. And I transitioned to a promotion track line. The School of Ed does not have tenure um, within the Hopkins system to um, become a more traditional assistant, and now I'm an associate professor, so on and so forth. So I think in telling my story, it is very important for me, and as a person, again, who identifies as a woman of color, to kind of see that balance 
of the living of the life in the academics. So I do do research still around father engagement, um, teacher partnerships in terms of how we are involving family members, mom and dad or others in today's world because we have much more diverse family structures. I'm also most recently starting a line of inquiry around social justice and ways that we are better supporting students um, of color in graduate um, settings such as uh, Hopkins, if you will. So I look at my research interests being around both school family community partnerships and issues of DNI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so for me, it's not just the job, it is very much the personal. And on some levels, I can't separate the two. And so it can be an interesting walk in the sense that, you know, I also live in Baltimore City, my child's a graduate of city schools. So when you read those stats, you know, once upon a time, she was included in those when you want to look at stats around, you know, what children in city schools are doing. I still have family in city schools. So I find my career in academia to be an interesting tension between both the political and the personal. Wow, thank you so much. Uh, and Dr. Fauci, how do you communicate your academic story? Uh, great, thank you so much. So um, I'm an immigrant, an American, a cell biologist, a professor, a science advocate. Um, my lab studies these antenna that are found on almost all cells of the human body that when they're abnormal, they give rise to a whole, rise to a whole host of diseases, including blindness, obesity, diabetes, cancer, you name it. Um, but I also fight for the future of science that I want to see for myself and for others, um, whether it be in publishing and workforce issues, assessment or incentives. Um, most of the things I'm involved in came from not asking for permission or power to get involved in the things that I think are important. Um, and for example, um, from wanting to meet my own needs, I started a peer mentorship network for junior faculty worldwide uh, called New PI Slack that now has more than 2,500 members. Um, another example is that the organization I'm now president of was, um, I got involved by sitting on my couch and watching some meeting that was webcast, um, you know, as a complete outsider and just deciding that I wanted to um, get involved and that this was something that was important to me. Um, and so while my educational path seems quite linear, um, the hurdles and events that were uh, within were not um, between restarting graduate school um, in a completely new field after almost five years to experiencing a death and a birth during my postdoc. Um, it took a long time for me to realize that the tumultuous path, um, you know, due to unforeseen life events were not the exception, but the rule, um, and that our unique challenges and our experiences are what give us sort of our superpowers and contribute to our ingenuity um, in what we, what we bring to our fields, um, and that there are really infinite paths to success. So that's something I hope that people appreciate. Wow. So I guess speaking of these hurdles, um, I imagine that we all have our personal hurdles, whether that be because of life situations or anything else. So can you talk about how you dealt with some of these hurdles that might have been imposed from society or just like personal life events? Dr. Fati. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, so absolutely. I would say that, um, you know, I think as as I've gotten further along in my career, um, I've, you know, become more and more underrepresented, you know, so when you're when you're in school, you know, usually there's sort of 50 50 um, boys and girls and even all, all the way up into I think I would say in my field up until postdoc, it's pretty evenly split gender wise. Um, but then after that, there's sort of a bottleneck and it starts to thin out and especially as you get, you know, you know, post tenure and, and things like that. And so as I've gotten more, at, you know, further along in my career, I've become underrepresented. And I would say that only, it is really only um, as I became underrepresented that I started to feel those pressures. So before that, I would say that it didn't, I, those, those types of, her, the, those types of challenges didn't, um, you know, didn't, feel like they weighed on me. And so you can imagine how for people who are who are underrepresented from from much earlier on would would experience those um, those hurdles. So I would say that one way in which I thought, you know, that especially once I became a professor, that 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 gender played a role in my career is that, um, you know, often I felt that as a woman and a woman of color, um, and, this, and particularly as a junior person, and I think this happens a lot for junior people, it's easy to sort of feel like you're getting dismissed, especially when you're in rooms where you need to, um, 
you're at the table and, and, and you want to speak up. Um, and so earlier on, I had to sort of speak up louder and more assertively and learn to push forward no matter how it felt to, to be to, to feel dismissed. Um, and, um, you know, I, I would say that that learning and practicing how to do that was a really useful skill that has turned out to pay off in countless ways mm -hmm. in my career. Um, so, you know, yeah, I think we like to tell ourselves that there are sort of people who are good at this and people who are not good at this. And it's either in your nature or it's not in your nature to sort of speak up. And um, I would say that it feels to me like it's extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, that I think, I think none of us are sort of, you know, born inherently good at that. And it's just, um, and that the people who appear to be very good at it seem to have had a lot of practice. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, as you do these things more, um, it's easier to get more comfortable and then also feel like you're, um, are, are getting better at it and, and are then subsequently taken more seriously. But, um, when, when your voice is heard, it can really, um, the payoff can be enormous and I can't um, overstate the benefit of trying to put in the, the, the practice, um, even mm -hmm. if it feels uncomfortable to find that voice. Wow, that was really insightful. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Jennifer, um, were you ever affected by underrepresentation? And if so, how did that affect your communication and how did you overcome any hurdles of that sort? Yeah, I think, I mean, you have a panel of three women. So of course we've all felt um, the gender um, bias in different ways. And I would also say for me, graduate school, where I most felt um, I, disadvantage feels like the wrong word. Well, it, I mean, it felt it at the time, like I really felt um, I didn't know, I didn't know how to be a graduate student. Um, I didn't come from, you know, a family of, of academics. And it's, you know, I arrived and it seemed like everybody else sort of knew what you were supposed to do. And I, I was very, very lost. I came and I, you know, it was like, oh, courses don't have syllabi. Nobody tells you that like, you're supposed to write a seminar paper. What is a seminar paper? Um, really just basic stuff. And also, you know, I'm living on a stipend and I didn't have, you know, family financial support to rely on. And so I had to, in the summer when we were not funded, I had to work 40 hours a week to make money. And that was something that my peers for the most part were not having to do. And they were able to just kind of go do research, you know, without additional funding necessarily, or they knew how to apply for funding to get summer money. And I, I didn't know that I was supposed to do that or how to do that. So I felt, um, you know, it, I know like the term first ger first generation student is referring to undergraduates. I wasn't. My, my parents did go to college, but I was first generation graduate student, which sort of sounds like a silly thing to say. But there was just this kind of unspoken um, language of how to be a graduate student that I just felt like I had no idea what I had gotten myself into or how to sort of swim. <laughs> um, and it took me a long time to learn the ropes, um, to figure out how to, okay, look for funding sources, find those funding sources that I was even supposed to be doing research in the summer. I thought that was just, oh, okay, summer's off. I guess I should be working, you know, just a job. Um, so it took me a while to kind of learn how to be an academic in that way. Um, and that felt like, you know, both a financial and just like a culture thing that I was, um, that I was not part of a, a group that seemed to kind of be the in-group. Um, so that was, I think, the most significant for me. And that's something that now as a faculty member, I, I really focus a lot on mentorship um, because it's something that like I needed. I needed more. Um, I needed more than your traditional mentoring role. I really needed a little bit of um, like handholding, I guess, is the way to to say it in the beginning. Um, and just, you know, a little bit of, um, you know, that imposter syndrome, which I know is a theme today. Um, it really shines through when you feel like you're the only one like you. Um, so not just, you know, there were plenty of women in my program, um, but yeah, feeling like I was the only one that, you know, was coming to graduate school without a clue of really what graduate school was. I just knew I was a good student and I liked research and I wanted to come do this. And I really was quite naive about what exactly I was getting myself into. Um, but in terms of, you know, in my career, um, you know, I've been very fortunate to have gotten a tenure track job. I recognize how um, how unlikely that is in in these times. Um, and one thing I'm very fortunate about now is that I'm at a women's college, and so I actually see my gender as an asset in terms of um, connecting with students. And I feel very much respected on campus in terms of you know, it's women are in all of the positions of power. It's a very empowering. 
place to work. Um, so I really can't complain in that respect. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, we've all had our experiences to some degree, but I've been very, very fortunate for the most part. And I recognize that privilege. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we have a question in the chat that we will address right after Dr. Um, this talks about her struggles, just how she overcame her own hurdles and how she created that and overcame that. So my parents are both from small towns in South Carolina and they were born in the late forties. And I say that to say that they very much came of age in the sixties and the lovely civil rights movement. So first and for foremost, I was brought out, brought up with the notion that I had to be three times as good. So in the sense of that you do your quote unquote very best. So in so much believing that I um, should be someplace, that was not my issue. My issue on some level is the emotional and psychological pain and trauma of microaggressions from other people who may not necessarily believe that you believe that or um, that you should be there and that there's some form of affirmative action or other things that were going on as people were trying to quote unquote diversify the ranks and things of that nature. So to just always do 110% to put my best foot forward on some levels, it is a little bit of the quote unquote superwoman syndrome and that you try to do all things and be all things. I um, am also a single parent. So when I was going to school and earning my doctorate, I had a child and trying to balance being a good parent for her. And I said earlier that I worked with teen moms. So it was also important to do my best to help my daughter not become a teen mom because I recognize all the things that go into that as well. So just finding the balance, if you will, and those people in my life who would A, listen to me when I needed to let it go, because work would not have been the appropriate place to let it go. But you do need to let it go so you can come back to work and present and behave in that way of professionalism that ultimately advances your cause because people get to see you and see the value of your work. And that becomes more of the focus as opposed to that I'm black or that I'm a female which you know both apply to me. So it really is for me more so making sure that I have a strong network support, primarily outside of work. So again, I can get out what I need to get out so I can still go back to work and be fruitful and productive. Wow, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, all right, so we have a question in the chat. So it's a question for Dr. Wester. You mentioned how your work has been shaped or influenced by your institution. Can you talk more about that process when you first got your job and has it at all resulted in growth or do you feel like you made compromises? Question. Yeah. So I'm in my fifth year at Notre Dame. And when I first was hired, um, even in the interview, there was a lot of questions about their mission, their mission, their mission, their mission. And I was just, you know, I've never known about the mission of any institution I've been a part of, you know, both in undergraduate and graduate school, even I had taught at a boarding school and I couldn't really tell you what the mission was of the institution. And I sort of thought like, yeah, okay, yeah, the mission, I believe in it. Um, and then I realized once I got there that no, it is absolutely central to everything that happens on our campus. All curriculum and, you know, the entire life of the school is built around this mission, which is about, you know, it's a women's college. So it's, you know, advancing women in the world, but also like educating leaders to transform the world. It's about social justice. We're a Catholic institution. So it's rooted in like the Catholic intellectual tradition. And this was all new stuff to me. Um, I had not had a Catholic education. So learning what that meant, that kind of intellectual tradition, it was definitely a learning process. And you are steeped in it. You are trained in it. You actually, as a new faculty member, go through a mission orientation where you learn all about it. Um, and at first I was sort of like, okay, yes. And then gradually year by year, when you realize how much it um, just really fills, I mean, all the students are really aware of it, faculty, it's just part of everything. And it's just part of the life of the university. And so it kind of was this gradual transition without even necessarily realizing what was happening at first that, oh, this feels really urgent. If I want to make art history relevant to these students who care very deeply about, you know, they chose this school in some cases because of this mission, or they love it here because of this mission, I need to think about how I can make my field um, mesh with these this mission to advance women and to support social justice initiatives. And, you know, it's also a really great call <laughs> in general to think about how can your field be 
relevant to students who are not going to major in it, right? We don't have very many art history majors. Most are just taking it to get their art credit. So how can I reach them and make them care about this and make, and make them realize that this, um, that this field is relevant to their lives? And, you know, it meant developing new courses, um, a required course on women in art. Um, I developed a course on African-American art, um, helping them really connect to art history um, and how it how it's part of activism and social justice and and gender equity. Um, and so that in my teaching is where that really started to happen first. And then as I reflected on my own research and looking and I'm thinking, you know, all these things, these changes I'm making in the classroom, why am I still just writing about our like typical white Western European male artists? Like that's where my research is. And it really didn't feel right anymore. And so I really, you know, as in the classroom, I kept focusing on whose stories are not being told and, and how have we, um, diminished, you know, the work of women by just, you know, having these categories of what's important that were determined by men and that's, you know, purposefully downplayed the things that women were excelling in or made it look like, you know, sort of told a different story about what they were doing. Um, and so in my research now, I've, you know, still focusing on the same period, that post-war French moment that I was studying, I'm like, well, where are the women in this story? And let me find those stories. And now that's where my research is focused. Um, and then I've also, as I've taught more of um, African American art, like I've started doing more research in um, in issues of like race and the museum and and how we are communicating stories that way. So it doesn't at all feel like a compromise. It feels definitely like growth. It feels like I'm becoming the scholar that I want to be. Um, and I, you know, in many ways, I regret that I didn't have this enlightenment sooner in graduate school when I had the time to really dive more deeply into these questions, because now I'm doing it while balancing all this other, these other responsibilities. And I wish in graduate school, I had had this revelation, but better late than never. Um, and so I'm really, really pleased that I ended up at an institution that was, you know, focused on these things. And that wasn't just comfortable teaching the canon and, you know, letting everything just be the way it's been. So, yeah. And then in my gallery work, same, you know, trying to highlight the same um, untold stories and give a voice to different perspectives That's and make these connections with social justice. So doing an exhibition, I did an exhibition of work related to the opioid crisis last year. And so that was a way to draw in um, the general public um, to, to shed light on this public health issue and on this like the sort of psychological side of drug addiction and pull in different departments on campus and have this kind of um, issue that is central to so many different fields and different types of work that we can do to help to, to fix this social issue um, and to show how art can be part of that. So I feel, yeah, 100% this is growth and it's the right direction. And I'm very, very happy that I'm at the institution I'm at. Well. Thank you so much for answering that. And to our audience, this is an answer you got when you type a question in the chat. So anything you have in mind, just write it up and we'll address it. Um, so now let's move on to the journey section. Okay, so now we're all graduate students and we're coming up to the life-changing decision of should I go on with academia or should I join the industry? So you're all instructors or we're instructors at some point. So what are some of the pros and cons of selecting the academic path and being an instructor? Dr. Prachi, please start us off. I'm happy to. So um, I would say that uh, you know I am maybe an outlier in the sense that I am like 99.99% .99 satisfied with my job. <laughs> I really love it. So I, uh, the absolute, my absolute favorite thing about my job is that I get to decide what it looks like. Um, so you could, you could take two professors, even two in the same department, um, and, and you could look at how they choose to spend their time and energy, and it could be wildly different, right? Um, so yeah. there's just so much flexibility and freedom built into the system. You know, obviously, we also need to survive by the metrics decided by others. But um, for me, I, you know, look to maximize the joy in those expected activities and also uh, make sure I'm excelling in those activities so I can do exactly what I want. And that's what I'm doing. I feel like I spend, you know, the, you know, the bulk of my days doing exactly what I want and anything that I end up doing, it's probably because I chose to do that. Um, and so I just, I find that um, that amount of freedom and flexibility is just, um, it's so rewarding because I can, 
I can invent what this job is. It's not even like, oh, there's, there's, oh, you spend more time teaching or you spend more time doing research or you spend more time. Those are just the categories that exist. Then there's everything else that's out there. And those are all options too. You know, it's literally, um, you know, deciding not only what you want to spend your time doing, but who you want to spend time with. You know, mm -hmm. I find that one of the, my favorite things about this um, job is that I can sort of um, invent reasons to spend time with the people who fill my soul. <laughs> and I love that. I love that I can sort of participate in those activities and find ways to connect with those people, collaborate with those people, um, do things so that I'm surrounded by um, things that help my personal growth and make me happy. So um, I will say that that is, um, you know, I, I and I rarely say most most you know many of the things that I say that I enjoy. It's not that any individual thing is something that's unique to this, this to academia necessarily. Many things, you know, many of these different aspects um, may be, you know, very much possible in in something else. But I think the confluence of all of these um, factors with the scholarship and the mentorship and the um, the freedom and the um, sort of inventing the the job as you go along is something that I um, really enjoy about academia. Now, that passion is what we should all strive to be at. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. And actually, I have a follow up question for you. So does the way you communicate or present yourself differ when you were a graduate student to when you became like a professor? Um, is this for me? Yes. For yeah, you. OK, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I would say um, it's different, but not um, purposefully. In fact, I would actually encourage it to not be different. I feel like maybe I was, I, I know I was more timid and I know that I was more um, nervous as a student and as a postdoc. And I think I was very much um, a little bit more, you know, had blinders on and was more focused. Um, you know, I think that you'll have no shortage of people that will tell you to like put your head down and and work on your scholarship and and i i honest to god don't believe in it i i, I wish i could but i don't i really think that that is that's what everybody's doing i feel like you know in in academia you are looking to um distinguish yourself and do something unique you're not you're not actually trying to be like everybody else um and so i think that the, a lot of this advice to sort of do what everyone else is doing is a little bit fraught right you know i think instead we should be taking individual um, people and their differences and their strengths and amplifying those things rather than getting them to all fall in line and do this one thing um and so i really um i think that I wish actually that I had had this approach as a as a more junior person um, and as a student and as a postdoc to really um, to really um, you know put myself out there and um, you know maybe take more risks and make sure that people saw who I was as a person and who I was as a scholar um, and not be afraid of that rather than trying to sort of hide different pieces of, of me. Um, and so, you know, I, I've always felt that, you know, it's not really someone else's job to know what's going, what you're doing, right? What's going on with your work. And so I, I do think it's on us to, to sort of to be our own advocates and get ourselves out there um, and shake people by the shoulders and make them look at what we're doing, right? You know, it's just, and it's only human. It's not, it's not anyone's fault. We are, there's a fire hose of information out there. There's a fire hose of scholarship. You know, how, why is it anybody's job to pay attention to you, <laughs> you know, or even, you know, for any job, no matter whether it's an academic job or not, you know, you've got a pile of 400 applications, why you, right? It's sort of, you know, it's only, it only makes sense based on time restrictions and, and um, energy restrictions that people have to be able to put yourself in front of someone and explain to them what your strengths are. And I, I wish that I had, you know, known that or un really appreciated that throughout my career. So it has changed in the sense that I have realized that <laughs> and have, have, have um, taken more of a conscious effort to, um, you know, make sure people are aware of what I'm doing. But I think that that is something that people should be doing at all stages. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, and Dr. Yolanda, so you were an adjunct professor and a full-time instructor at different points. So how different mm -hmm. is the experience in both? And does your communication with people or when it comes to presenting yourself differ in both experiences? Um, as already has been said, how you present 
differs all the time based on your audience. I will answer your question, but I was doing a guest lecture for another professor here at Hopkins in their class one night. It was gonna be a panel conversation. And she introduced the panelists to one another prior to the start of the event. And one of them was a woman who was an African-American and a parent. It was a math content class where we were focusing on parent engagement to support students' math learning. And um, after the introductions, this woman came over to me and said, just because you're a doctor at Hopkins doesn't mean you know anything about parenting. And I told her, you are absolutely correct. I am, however, a single parent who also lives in Baltimore City and whose child goes to city schools. And those things were true at that point in time. And that totally changed her perception of who I was and what I had to say. So kind of thinking about who your audience is and how you need to connect with them so they are open to engaging in conversation with you. So in relation to being an adjunct, that can be a job where you're just kind of in and out and you show up and you teach your class and you go. It can also be a job that is much more interactive and engaging. Um, so in the context of where I adjunct the longest, it was a local community college. I did that for several years. But as an adjunct, I actually became involved in their faculty life as well. I went to their faculty meetings. I went to their academic trainings. They put out um, small scholarship opportunities for instructors to engage in learning new technology or to diversify their content. So on some levels, I probably was a fairly active um, adjunct, if you will, while simultaneously being full-time here at Hopkins. And the beauty of that is, yes, we can set our schedules. And in terms of, you know, the balance of teaching, scholarship, and service, that was a doable mix. At this point of my career, I do a lot much, I do much more administrative work. And it would not be as doable a mix right now because my time is just different in terms of meetings and demands from an administrative perspective, in addition to teaching scholarship and quote unquote regular service because administration is a type. So it is just the balance of what it is you want to do. Um, another joy is for me why I chose to adjunct at a community college. School of Ed is a graduate school. So community college students are very different in terms of how you help to shape and ground and kind of set them on the trajectory for what they think they want to do in life. And again, that's important to me, that even though I now work with adults, my goal in life is still ultimately impacting um, what I think of as children, that adolescent, you know, through adolescence. And so the community college was also like a natural next step in that respect. And I think it is important, as already been said, to find that blend of still what makes this job work for you and how does it, you know, keep you happy and motivated and moving forward. Wow, well, thank you so much. Um, all right, so this concludes our journey section and we have a couple of quick questions. Um, so first, Xen asks, does it matter for our academic story to have postdoc at a different institution from where we complete our PhD? And what matters more when we want to follow an academic path? Let's go with Dr. Prachi. Uh, so, you know, this is a somewhat of a complicated question just because um, I think we all feel this pressure that, um, and often um, sometimes, and I think it's born out of some of funding mechanisms that really want you to change direction and get um, sort of new training um, for a, a postdoc, you know? So the idea is, you know, a postdoc is really only worth doing if you're going to get another set of skills. Otherwise, why, why do it, right? Um, and so sometimes I think that that's inappropriately um, mapped onto what institution you're at. Some people, for very good reasons, have geographic restrictions, right? Um, and I think that this is something that I hope as, you know, in, in all fields we get away from and not, and not re requiring that because, of course, um, uh, you know, a lot of people are under this kind of pressure. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there are things about what, what, how should it be and, and how is it? <laughs> um, and so I know that a lot of people feel this pressure to move institutions, um, you know, during, during your postdoc. And, you know, my, my general feeling is, is to 
is to is to focus on that um, on that training aspect and, and to go and do what it is, what it is you actually what skills you actually hope to gain wherever that might be that might be in your home institution that might be at a different institution and and you may or may not have the freedom to go do that right so I think that whatever um, you know whatever you can tolerate with respect to um, aiming for the training that you really want to work with the people that you really want. That is the, I think that should be the goal more so than leaving to leave or staying to stay. Um, that it should be focused on what, what do you hope to get out of that period, that training period in your life and to do that intentionally rather than by default or because, you know, you've gotten advice to do whatever it is. I think if you focus on what it is you hope to learn and gain, um, you know, it is, it is easier to justify to everyone. You know, you can always, whenever you go on further in your career, you will be able to say, I went and worked with this person for this reason, wherever they are. <laughs> you know, I think that um, having that justification is, is um, and then, and then, and then everyone is constrained by life. And then that, that is what it is for every person. Thank you for answering that. Um, all right. So as graduate students, while a lot of our lives or most of our lives are spent doing research, there are networking opportunities or extracurricular opportunities elsewhere. So, and we need to strengthen these. So I'd like to ask you about some of your experiences regarding that. So Dr. Wester, so you've managed a massive campaign to restore, to restore a historical theater. How did that go? How did that experience help shape your career? And I imagine there was a lot of networking in that process. So like, can you talk about that aspect? So that actually, it's funny. I, so I am, very uncomfortable with networking in general. I'm very shy, extremely introverted, and I've always been somebody who just wants to put my head down, do the good work, and just move through life by demonstrating that I can do good work. I've never wanted to have to hobnob at conferences or like, and I'm not good at, oh, I met you and now I'm going to follow up and ask you to get coffee. I'm too shy for that. And so it's very much been a challenge my entire life <laughs> and academic career. Um, and that, <laughs> the irony of that is that that job I had, um, and it was just a part-time job I did while I was adjuncting right after I finished my PhD, it came about through sort of accidental networking, which was that I had gotten this research um, grant right after I finished um, my PhD at Hopkins. The program in museums and societies had this research opportunity, and I applied for it. And the woman, and I got it, and the woman I was working with sort of casually mentioned, oh, somebody asked me if I knew anyone that could just help out on this project, this campaign um, for the Parkway Theater in Baltimore. And I didn't know anything about the theater. Um, I did a little research, but I was sort of, you know, I was cobbling together an income at that time. I was adjuncting, I was doing this research project, but I was very much underemployed. And so I said, yes, interested. I don't even care if it's just, it was basically just, um, administrative work, you know, um, keeping track of spreadsheets and stuff. And I said, I don't have any experience in this, but like, I would love to get involved because, you know, it's historic preservation. It's in the city where I live and, you know, I will take it. <laughs> um, and so it was just, uh, I sort of lucked in through that networking with my colleague. Um, and then that just, I just it opened doors once I was there where I just kept taking on more responsibilities and, you know, using the skills I had saying, you know, like, I'm doing this basically hourly work of managing spreadsheets of like donor information. But, you know, I have a PhD in art history. Like, can I start writing some blog posts about the history of this building and what we're doing and and just kind of taking on things I wanted to do and, you know, developing relationships. At, it was through the Maryland Film Festival, developing relationships there. And they came to know me and they came to start to ask me to do other things. Um, my job, I was not like the fundraiser myself. I was organizing a committee of fundraiser, volunteer people who who kind of work to raise money for this project. And so my job was really just keeping all the information organized, helping them follow up with their leads. And so I wasn't having to do a lot of the reaching out to donors, but I did have to network with the people on that committee who are a lot of prominent Baltimore philanthropists. And so it was you know very intimidating to come in as this person with no experience in this field who doesn't run in these circles. Um, but they, you know, I did my job well. I stayed organized. I I showed up and, and showed that I knew what I was talking about. I learned so much about the theater and was able to talk about it um, intelligently. And that I think, you know, developed good relationships with the people on that committee, which, you know, <laughs> again, if I, uh, thankfully I, I did get my current job right after um, completing that work. Um, so I haven't 
really needed um, to continue working in that space. But I made all of these contexts that I know, you know, I could reach out and say, you may remember working with me on this campaign. And hopefully, like, again, my work will stand for itself in terms of you remember that I was organized and on time and 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 handled my work well and hopefully that would encourage them to um, to work with me if I wanted to get a coffee and talk to about talk to them about other opportunities but it was definitely um, big time stepping out of my comfort zone um, and you know just really using my own strengths to make it work for me you know that like I I know I can do research I know I can organize information clearly I know I can write um, and so let me use all of those things to sort of make this position work um, and that will help me, you know, then at the film festival talking to all these filmmakers and I don't have a background in film, um, but having, again, done the work, done the research, I could speak with them and we could find common ground of things we were interested in. And that helped me um, to feel more comfortable in that space. So yeah, it was definitely, and that's just another example of, you know, you don't know what opportunities will present themselves and like, you know, my approach has just been to say yes and um, and figure it out. And you know that you have certain strengths. You're going to feel imposter syndrome probably wherever you end up. Um, but if you focus on what you can do, um, you can you can make every situation work for yourself. And if you're if you're doing that well, then the people around you um, those become your kind of allies. That's your networking in a way too. So it doesn't all have to be that cold walking up to somebody at a conference, it can be developing relationships over a period of time through the work that you're doing. So we need to capitalize on surprise opportunities that we get. So I guess a follow up question to that, Dr. Jennifer, is um, how do you prioritize which stories to tell? So like which parts are more important to communicate for different types of opportunities? I mean, I think again, paying attention to your audience. And also like always for me, it's like I, I lead with the things that I'm most passionate about, right? That's the most interesting part of my story and the things that are most personal to me. So every PhD has a story about spending time, you know, or at least in the humanities, spending time in the archives and like digging through boxes and stuff like that. And that's great. But like, what is special to my story and what is unique to me? And how does do my personal like life experiences um, make my my experience or my academic life different. Um, but in terms of tailoring it to an audience, you know, for example, the my current position um, when I was applying for it, you know, it's very different from a lot of the other jobs I had applied for where my focus was telling the story of like my research and here's how I'm doing this groundbreaking work in this field and, you know, really trying to sell that like Johns Hopkins R1, like I've got the research chops. And it was much more about, okay, this is a small college that is very focused on relationships with students and teaching is the core of it. And so then it became very important to tell the story of you know, adjuncting, which I was as a graduate student, often you hear stories of like, oh, don't adjunct. It's a way of like, you know, it's it's you should not be distracted yes. by that or, you know, it's it's uh, you end up then on that track and you can't get off it. And I'm very thankful that I adjuncted because it gave me experiences that I could then talk about. And, you know, I remember you know, in high school learning, a good way of writing is show, don't tell, right? And one of the challenges when you're a graduate student is you have, it's hard to figure out, like, how can I show that I am a scholar committed to X, Y, and Z? Um, but once you have some experience under your belt, and for me, having adjuncted at a few different types of institutions, teaching classes outside my specialty as, as well as in them, that gave me things I could show. Like, okay, I took on this course, you know, that was fully online. I've taught online. Like, being able to show that I've had these experiences, um, I am a professor that um, is very adaptable to different formats and types of students. I have taught non-traditional students and here's how I did that. And here's how I taught, you know, studio artists about art history and being able to really um, pay attention to what your audience um, needs to hear from you. And then being able to, again, speak from the heart, speak with your passion, um, but again, to try to show and not tell. So not just say I'm a scholar who cares about this, but to show oh, well, you know, I, I had this gallery show about the opioid crisis. And that demonstrates to you that I'm somebody that's thinking about interdisciplinary aspects of art and that um, wants to see art as part of social justice. Um, so yeah, thinking about the audience in that way, um, at, you know, whether you're applying for a job or networking at a conference, you know, what is it that is gonna communicate the right thing to this audience? Thank you so much. 
Um, and Dr. Yolanda, so you led the Phi Delta Kappa chapter. And so how did that address your passions? And do you think that networking helped? And what would you advise us when it comes to networking with such professional groups? So I am a former classroom teacher myself. So I became a PDK member after I got my master's degree and I was a teacher. So first and foremost, it was an organization I was already familiar with and one that I was a member of and had um, interacted with people, done a variety of events. So I think looking at what your genuine interests are, where you spend your time, that's kind of where you make that connection. So obviously several years later, I found myself in position to become president of the chapter. And so I took that upon myself and it was very interesting and unique because while it is the Hopkins chapter, it is also very representative of Baltimore City educators and kind of making that connection, that interaction. We established a scholarship that we named after then Superintendent Nancy Grasmick. So that gave me another opportunity to interact and get to know her and so on and so forth. So by kind of sticking with something that I already knew, if you will, it allowed me to branch out and do some fairly um, new things there that build on, like I'd never done a capital campaign at that point, you know, we had to raise the money for the endowment for that scholarship. And that I think also then sparked my interest in my SIG. And I started out as a member at large, a fairly generic, you know, leadership role within the SIG. And I'm now chair of that. So I think when you do things kind of where you are in your natural interest, it spurs you along and you meet other individuals as well who then present opportunities that you take advantage of if the time um, allows and if it makes sense for who you are as a person and where you'd like your career to go. Because I think sometimes too, we have to remember that it's okay to say no. You don't have to say yes to everything. Wow, thank you for that advice, thank you. Um, all right, so Dr. Prachi, you received the 2020 Women in Cell Biology Junior Award for excellence in research from for excellence in research from the American Society for Cell Biology. I know that sounds long, but it's a great award. <laughs> so you have to be really good at telling your story and communicating your strengths and achievements in order to achieve such a prestigious award. So how can we communicate our stories like that? And what advice do you have to us in terms of presenting ourselves, like some skills or you know some tricks? Yeah, absolutely. So I would say that this sort of ties into something that I said before, which is that you really have to, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, beautiful scholarship out there, right? So, um, you know, how, how do you get, you know, your work, um, in, you know, noticed and known? And, and, I, and I feel like this is one of those things where you have to sort of uh, sort of shake people by the shoulders and make them look and, and, and also really continue to make the case for why you think your work is important and why you're pushing on the forefront of um, sort of important knowledge. And so, um, you know, this is a case that every time you put out a, a publication or something like that, you have an opportunity to make that case. But, you know, again, there's just a fire hose of literature out there. And so, you know, one thing that I do, you know, every time we put a, you know, a preprint on the, on the server, is on a preprint server is to, you know, I'll go on Twitter and I will put a big tweet storm about this, not just the work, but the story behind it. You know, you know, how did we make these discoveries? What was really important about it? How did we stumble upon, sometimes things happen by accident. How did we stumble upon some new finding and really um, bring the story to life for people in a way that really helps them understand the fullness of, of, of what uh, we were able to discover and why it was important, right? Um, and so these are, many of those other aspects of it are not something that, that go into a sort of formal scholarship, right? You don't get an opportunity to ever tell the backstory of your work. Um, and so this is one of those things where, I, you know, I am a huge fan of Twitter. I'm a huge fan of um, being able to directly connect with people. Um, and so um, I really like to take advantage of, of that and make sure that we, and also on my blog or wherever we get an opportunity to put, you know, to, to tell our story again, to reframe the story. So I think, you know, part of it is really this self-advocacy. And, um, you know, and I think that this is something that, you know, maybe culturally or even otherwise, or even personality-wise, people feel quite uncomfortable with. And, and you get, you know, you'll always get people who tell you that, uh, you know, don't be, um, don't be that person who's, who's just um, sort of, you know, 
advertising yourself all the time. But, but again, I, I just think that that, um, that that's one way to do things. I, I feel like that it's really, really hard for people to know what you're doing for good reason, unless you are doing that. And so, um, you know, not for this award, but for, for other leadership roles I've had, um, you know, I've self-nominated for things. So, I'll, you know, if there's, if there's something, an opportunity that comes up, um, I will think of who are the very best people in the world that I can think of that would be really, really good at this and also self-nominate. <laughs> and, and I've won some of those things, right? And it's, and it's if, if I think I'm particularly well suited for it, if I think I'm also one of those people, right? Um, and so, um, you know, so, but it, you know, it, it's hard to do that, right? It's really hard to think that, 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 yeah, you know, that you could compete for things like that. And, um, and the only way, you know, you, you can only win the things that you try for, right? Otherwise you just never have the opportunities. And, and I learned that lesson from a very senior person once at a, at a conference who it was, um, a conference it was one of these sessions that was directed towards sort of uh, women in science and and it was a very senior male you know white male colleague who who said you know and, and this is someone who is extremely famous sort of a grandfather of the field who said oh yeah i always have you know an updated cv that i can give to someone so i can ask them to nominate me for something and it just totally blew my mind i just thought like what are you talking about? Don't they just like th just throw these awards at you? <laughs> like, don't doesn't that just like magically appear? And apparently not. Apparently, even the most accomplished, the most uh, you know senior, the you know people doing the most well-known scholarship are still doing this, right? So as long as we sit there and think, oh no, no, that's not what's supposed to happen. It's just supposed to magically appear and arrive, and and we are supposed to be bequeathed with this you know <laughs> uh, wonderfulness. It's just not how how it happens. And so there are people who are advocating for themselves, and and we should too. So I would say that that is. Um, that is that I think for me it was um, something that it took me a while to get comfortable with, but it, it, I feel like it's um, necessary. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and we have a question from the audience. So sometimes core values can contradict conformity and some people may not like that. So when communicating our story, how can we both stand up for our values and keep people happy if, if it matters? So Dr. Yolanda, can you please answer that? So personally speaking, I always have to be true to self. Um, without going too far deep, I'm a spiritual individual. When it's my time, I want to go with a clean conscience. So having said that, time, place, and purpose. I think there are always ways to say what you need to say and believe, even um, if other people don't necessarily want to hear it. So I've always been a passionate advocate for diversity and about diversity. And when I first got here um, at Hopkins, I got a lot of, we're not gonna lower standards so we can be diverse. And you shouldn't, and you don't have to. There are many qualified people, so on and so forth. So part of it, I think, is practicing telling your story. I am an introvert. If you've ever taken the Myers-Briggs, I have almost no E. I really am an introvert. Um, a, I enjoy what I do, so that comes out when I'm teaching and doing other things. And B, as a graduate student in particular, when I went to conferences, I actually had to literally make myself talk to like five people that I didn't know to get out of my comfort zone and to start making those connections. And so as you practice, you become more comfortable with who you are and what you do. I am also personally speaking, not out to change anybody else's point of view or have them think and feel the way I do. And so I'm very clear about that. I might say I want you to also think about how it is what you think and do impacts others that you work with, that you write about, so on and so forth. But ultimately, I think you just need to decide what you can live with. And I even say that to my doctoral students now, what can you live with? Because to me, like I said earlier, this isn't just a job. It's intertwined, and I'd like to think that if it ever became a job, I would take that as a sign it was time to move on and do something else. Wow, I really respect that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, so we have a couple of minutes remaining. So I guess I'll use this panel as a case study and ask you each how you prepared for this, like whether like just mental preparation or anything like that for any talk. So Dr. Jennifer, what do you do before these talks? Um, well, I was very grateful that you sent some questions that we might expect in advance. And I did run through them. I kind of jotted down some notes. I thought through my answers. And even like this morning in the shower, I'm thinking through like, how do I tell my academic story? And like, 
how am I going to express this? You know, I didn't write a script or anything, but just giving myself that kind of moment to run through. And that's definitely like leading up to a job interview or a presentation. Like I'm always in the car reciting, just practicing saying it. Cause if you, you know, say it in your head, even, you know, again, not even a script, but just, okay, if I get this question, how am I going to answer that? Um, just to help you feel more comfortable and like, you're not in the moment kind of frozen um, in that way. Um, and, you know, I looked over the whole conference and sort of what is the purpose and who might be attending this conference and what might they be hoping to get out of this um, and just trying to get a sense of, you know, what's going to be most helpful to people um, for this particular instance. But yeah, otherwise, it's just a lot of mental, you know, I like to write things down by hand, just the practice of not re reading from it, but just the practice of writing helps me to kind of cement things in my mind. And then, yeah, just talking out loud to myself um, <laughs> helps me. Thank you, Dr. Yolanda. I have a personal mantra, time, place, and purpose. And everything I do, I think about under those three things. Um, so time in context, what's going on in the world, what's going on professionally, what's the timing of this event, um, where is it happening, um, what types of things, how, you know, in the Zoom space, and what's the purpose, what's the intent. And I'd like to think that when I do something like this, that I get out of something, I get something out of it as well as ideally giving something to those individuals who are listening. So I think about all those things. I am also very much a visual person. So I actually created a PowerPoint of just pictures, no words, that I thought were representative related to the questions that you sent. And those things kind of spark my ideas, my thoughts, and kind of coalesce the big picture thought of where I want to go and what I want to do. And I actually have it, I have dual monitors. I actually have that PowerPoint open so I can see those visuals as I've been engaging with you because that's something also that helps to ground me and to center and focus me. That is really creative. And I didn't hear anything like that before. So thank you for sharing that. It's a great idea, honestly. <laughs> um, so finally, Dr. Prachi. Um, yeah, so I so I also took a look ahead of your uh, ahead of time at your questions, and I, I always think about you know usually when I'm asked to do something, whether it's a panel or if it's a, a scientific seminar or something like that, um, you know usually I'm asked to do it because um, sort of people want either my viewpoint or you know that they they or they're really interested in the science or whatever it is. So I, I really try to um, you know in thinking about who who this audience is, and I. I I sort of uh, feed off of a little bit of being spontaneous. So I jot down ideas too and think about, oh, what is it that I don't want to forget to say? So the things I write down are the things I don't want to forget to say um, in the moment. Um, but everything else, you know, I, I get extremely bored if I don't get to sort of let my passion come through for the topic that I'm talking about. And so, um, so often what will happen is that when I'm preparing for um, a talk, I will just make sure that I um, have something prepared that I that I don't want to forget, and then um, and then I sort of let my excitement um, take over. And so, um, because I think that that excitement is something that will will speak to the audience, um, and, mm -hmm. and um, I think about making sure I focus on the things that will that will connect with that particular audience because sometimes it will be um, an audience of people who are way more senior to me and in positions of power and, and that I'm trying to persuade about something sometimes it will be you know junior people who are you know looking for inspiration and so you know those audiences are you know the 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 type of tack you want to take um, and I think it's possible to excite anyone about anything <laughs> you know it's just you just have to um, you know, know, know what, what those things are that people connect with. So I sort of think about that ahead of time is, is what, what type of um, things will really speak to and excite this particular audience um, and really focus on that. Well, that's definitely very effective because we could really see your passion throughout the panel. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for coming to this panel. We hope you enjoyed it. Um, we hope you also enjoy other panels throughout the day and just enjoy the conference overall. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Pachi, Dr. Yolanda, and Dr. Jennifer. And yeah, that was a great experience, honestly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.